I think, like many of you, I watched in horror as Russia's zealous saber-rattling turned into a full-on invasion of the sovereign nation of Ukraine earlier this year. Say what you want about Ukraine's government, the Azov Battalion, and treatment of ethnic Russians, this is still an act of aggressive war. It's actually kind of part of Russia's playbook. They find damning information that isn't even wrong exactly, and push it at just the right time to cause political chaos to their advantage. I'm not a Russiagate guy or anything, but this is undoubtedly their go-to move, and we should at least be aware that it is a move. We should also be aware that the United States, acting in a similar fashion, does not constitute an excuse for Moscow's actions. I'm against the US when it overthrows governments to save oil speculators and arms manufacturers, and I'm against Russia invading a country to keep it under their thumb. It seems impossible in this conflict to acknowledge that two things can indeed be true. What really got me thinking about this video, though, is the jingoism that I've been seeing on display in the wake of the invasion. We had people encouraging nuclear-armed countries to recklessly engage in aggression towards each other and minimize the possible dangers that nuclear war possesses, which has me very concerned. I had just had a baby, and I was holding him, thinking about how we were closer to a nuclear arms exchange than at any other point in my life. And as I write this script, the war seems to be escalating in very concerning ways, which makes me terrified of what happens when the great powers lose their game of chicken and what world my son will grow up in the aftermath of. And it's not like I'm not sympathetic. In fact, one of my old colleagues from grad school was from Ukraine and he and his family are there right now fighting Russian troops. We spent so much of our life in the unipolar world of the American hegemony, which is coming to an end. And part of that multipolar world, combined with arable land decreasing from climate change, means that we're going to see more stuff like this, not less. I mean, Canada is probably one Ogallala aquifer depletion away from developing weapons of mass destruction ourselves. I just also can't stop thinking about the moment that radicalized me as a teenager the invasion of Iraq. The media and political authorities drove a narrative, and it seemed before I even knew what was going on, war was happening. And as a historian, I'm keenly aware of how fast a state can stir up jingoism when trying to manufacture consent for conflict. Anyways, last time on this series, we covered the dramatic downfall of the USSR and the pillage and poverty Russians endured in the years after at the hands of what amount to no more than vultures feeding off the corpse of the Grand Soviet project. After Russia's first president, Boris Yeltsin, resigned in disgrace in 1999, he was replaced by a little-known political operative, Vladimir Putin. He's the man who steered Russia from that point to the current war in Ukraine. And how did we get there? Well, I just can't shut up about stuff, so I'm gonna talk about it. Kind of keeping with the theme of this video, the Western portrayal of Vladimir Putin is very one-dimensional. He's an evil supervillain with no motivations beyond being an evil man who does bad things because he's evil. The erasure of nuance, or at least three-dimensional understanding of Putin and his actions, is why I decided to make this whole section. However, since I will need to point this out to a certain group of people, to understand is not to support. Putin's goals are to enshrine himself at the center of an empire with ambitions of territorial conquest and regional hegemony. Though he cloaks his obvious imperialist motivations under a tissue paper of language about criticizing Western imperialism. And again, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, many of his criticisms aren't wrong. Maybe not the stuff about panicking about trans people or gay rights, but uh, you know, I think we can all just agree that's bad. Of course, saying that. It's like I've never read a comment section. But you know, he likes to say nice things about a just world order, then goes and launches an uncalled for war that's killed thousands. He's at the end of the day, a politician. But unfortunately, this politician has his hands on the levers of the power of a dictatorship and is bending a powerful country to his personal will. So who is this guy anyway? Well, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin was born in 1952 in the city of Leningrad, which today is called St. Petersburg. Growing up, he was a good little Marxist-Leninist. You know, he read his theory, read his Lenin, read his Marx, read his Engels, and also was a prolific studier of martial arts. 
In the 1970s, young Putin studied law, and as part of his education was required to join the Communist Party. Which was the style at the time. After school, he wound up joining the KGB, the Soviet Intelligence Service. Sort of like the Soviet CIA. His early duties included monitoring foreign nationals visiting in the country, as well as Russian officials. He then became a spy, working in East Germany in the late 80s due to his knowledge of the German language. He might also have worked as an undercover agent for a time in New Zealand, but that is less verified. When East Germany fell, he tried to protect as many Soviet assets and information he could and get it out of the country. On suspicions of his loyalties during the fall of the East German government, Putin had to resign from the KGB, being out on active reserve. He later had some uh, not-so-nice things to say about communism, so this probably checks out. I imagine you don't want your communist government secret police to have members against the entire project. He was on the side of people like Boris Yeltsin and those wanting to see an end of the communist government in Russia. After that, he might have spent some time as a cab driver. After returning to the USSR, but before his 1991 resignation, Putin worked for the city government for Leningrad reportedly in their International Affairs Department. In this job, he reportedly made some backroom deals that got him in shit. He negotiated a trade deal where uh, several commodities were sold for way under their value in exchange for food aid that never materialized. Despite this, and the fact that investigators recommended he be fired, Putin stayed in the government until 1996, bouncing around various titles within the Exterior Relations Department. He also became politically involved, starting the St. Petersburg branch of a Russian nationalist liberal political party supporting Boris Yeltsin's government. For the entire time of his career in municipal politics, he maintained a good relationship with the city's mayor, Anatoly Sobchak. When Sobchak lost the mayorship in an election in 1996, Putin resigned from his position to move to Moscow and help run a department of the Russian government tasked with managing Soviet assets abroad and transferring them into the control of Russia. But his political career really began to take off in 1997 when Boris Yeltsin appointed Putin as his deputy chief of staff in addition to running the department he was already working for. But in 1998, Yeltsin appointed Putin as director of the Federal Security Service, or FSB, the successor to the KGB of the USSR. But the biggest day in Putin's career must have been August 9th, 1999. The morning started momentous enough with a promotion to one of three deputy prime ministers. Later that day, Yeltsin made him the acting prime minister, the fifth in the last 18 months, just to show how fluid the political situation was. And then, before dinner, Yeltsin urged him to run for president, and he agreed. He had a lot of rivals to the presidency, though. Boris Yeltsin's health was fading, and many ambitious people wanted to be his successor. Given the tense situation, with conflict breaking out in various places on the Russian periphery, Putin used a law and order focus to rise to the top. Then, Yeltsin suddenly resigned at the end of 1999, handing the presidency to Putin. His first action in the role was to pass a decree absolving Yeltsin of numerous corruption charges he was currently facing. Three months later, he easily won the presidency, getting over 50% in a crowded field. And he's been in charge, more or less, ever since. There was a brief break from 2008 to 2012, where due to term limits, the presidency went to Dmitry Medvedev, with Putin acting as the prime minister. Analysts suggest that even in this four-year period, Putin was de facto still in charge, or at least equal with the president. Putin's presidency can be seen as him responding to a series of violent crises, but his priorities come through in his second inaugural address that he made in 2004. He called the dissolution of the Soviet Union a major geopolitical disaster. This thinking would inform much of his domestic and foreign policy. At home, his popularity comes from a near total control of media, but also because he ruled as the major economic problems of the Soviet collapse began to turn around somewhat. He also took down and exiled the richest man in Russia for tax evasion. The move has been seen as Russia moving towards a sort of state capitalism in the ballpark of China. He's also been called out at home and abroad for being extremely repressive to any journalists who report on the doings of his regime. Most famous would be the case of Anna Politovskaya, who was shot in the lobby of her apartment on Vladimir Putin's birthday. 
Every election he's won has also been under scrutiny and accused of election fraud. He might be popular, but the general consensus is that Russian elections don't really matter all that much. He was also made extremely unpopular for supporting repressive laws against the LGBTQ community. The gay propaganda bill was considered monstrous for 2012, but today seems almost tame compared to what your middle-of-the-road conservative proposes. And lastly, needs to be said, he's been accused of interfering with the 2016 American election, pushing an influence campaign to help Donald Trump, a thing he denies. And to be honest, the extent of such a program, as well as its true weight in the role of getting Trump elected, is a little wishy-washy and hard to see what really happened, for now anyway. But of course, this is just at home. Putin's right now most infamous for his aggressive foreign policy and an attempt to rebuild the sphere of influence on the old Soviet Union. Since the collapse of the USSR, the Russian government and many Russians consider themselves the de jure inheritors of the Soviet Union. To many people, the two terms are interchangeable. Many of the new republics to get independence after the collapse were also former subjects of the old Russian Empire before the 1917 revolution, so much of this region to many Russians still seems like it's in their zone of influence. And while the USSR collapse was a setback on that front, again, according to them, this would be remedied. So Russia found itself in many diplomatic plays, wars, and standoffs in order to either preserve the republics within Russia from further splintering off, or to get those who got independence back under Moscow's control. First, let's talk about Georgia, and to get the joke out of the way, Putin indeed went down to Georgia because he was looking for a soul to steal. Those souls being part of Georgia that declared themselves independent of Georgia, and would likely go and look to join the Russian Federation. Wait, wait a minute. That sounds very familiar. And when Georgia, with this disputed territory, began to make moves towards closer collaboration with the West, Russia ramped up a diplomatic crisis which spilled over into a war. There really is a Russian playbook to this, isn't there? I I'm starting to see a pattern here. These are nations that were under the former Soviet zone of control, something Russia feels entitled to, and as they make moves which would take them away from the control of Moscow, all of a sudden, these independent movements friendly to Russia become very well armed, and Russia steps in to defend them when it's not super certain Russia wasn't the aggressor. It's sort of inside out for the case of Chechnya, but this pattern does seem to bear out. And this would play out again when it comes to a country very close to Russia's identity, Ukraine. Hey everybody, just want to let you know that there's an extended version of this video that goes into a brief history between uh, Russia and Ukraine, going all the way back to the ancient Kievan Rus, and you can find that on my streaming platform, Nebula. Nebula is basically a platform where myself and many other creators, many that I know that you like, got together to make a platform where we can express ourselves and not have to worry about things like demonetization or the algorithm getting in the way of our art. With Nebula, you can get everything ad-free and you can see experiments with different types of content. On Nebula, you can find all sorts of content created by many creators that I know you're a big fan of, including myself, but also my streaming co-host Mia Mulder, my podcast co-host NerdSync, as well as other great creators like FD Signifier, Jesse Gender, Jacob Geller, Philosophy2. The list is gigantic and it's getting bigger all the time. And we've already been able to do content on the platform that lets us collaborate in interesting ways and make content that we just couldn't make on YouTube for one reason or another. But today I'm actually here to talk about another platform that we've been partnered with, Curiosity Stream. Well, that's because Curiosity Stream really loves educational creators like myself and want to make sure that there's more of it. So we worked out a really great deal where if you go to the link in the description and sign up for Curiosity Stream, you get Nebula for free. And as long as you stay a member of Curiosity Stream, you will also stay a member of Nebula. Now, Curiosity Stream is already a really good price, but they've put together a limited time deal where for under $16, you can get Curiosity Stream and Nebula for a year. And with that, you get access to CuriosityStream's library of thousands of high-budget non-fiction videos. So you can get the big blockbusters on CuriosityStream, and then on Nebula, you can get the work of creative, independent creators like myself. It's really a match made in heaven. If you're looking for something to watch on CuriosityStream to get started, I would recommend, if you like this video, a series called KGB The Sword and Shield. 
It's a history of the KGB, the secret service of the Soviet Union. The documentary certainly has an opinion, but it's a really great documentation of the organization that Vladimir Putin came out of. So when you go to the link in the description and sign up with the code Step Back, as soon as you're signed up and ready to go with Curiosity Stream, you'll get an email from Nebula welcoming you to the platform and give you your access to that as well. That's curiositystream.com slash step back. If you go, you're really supporting me and other educational creators. So we really appreciate it. And with that, I think the people on Nebula just got all of their bonus content, so let's all reconvene, shall we? After the Soviet collapse, the following decades played out like Russia and Ukraine were bitter divorcees trying to divide their assets. Ukraine inherited a massive nuclear stockpile, but one that wasn't functional without Russian command and control. They wound up handing this over to Russia, and with the help of the international community, dismantled the rest of its stockpile. Furthermore, tensions began to arise about the ownership of the Crimean Peninsula. Russia argued that since the government of Crimea had been transferred to Ukraine in 1954 by Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, Russia argued it was an illegitimate treaty, and the two countries argued about who would have it until they signed a pact in 1997 which divided the Soviet Black Sea Fleet as well as allowed Russia to lease some naval bases. In a shocking by today treaty of friendship, they made further agreements, extended some of these leases, and mutually agreed to respect each other's borders. The good times didn't last long into the 2000s though. Some joint infrastructure projects proceeded along, but the overall vibe under Putin's regime was one of trying to reintegrate Ukraine back into the Russian sphere of influence. Many Russians felt Ukraine and the Little Russians still belonged to their dominion, and you can imagine Ukrainians aren't jazzed about becoming a buffer state again. Ukrainian international relations began to drift more towards the European Union, and an interest in joining NATO, the alliance of capitalist states, made specifically to oppose the Soviet Union that still existed in the 2000s because... Uh, Ukraine was far from united on these issues, however. Western regions, which never were under the Russian Empire who spoke Ukrainian, were more amenable to siding with the EU, while in the East, where many communities still speak Russian, they welcomed closer ties to their linguistic and ethnic brethren in Russia. These overtures to the West are seen in Russia, however, as an act of aggression against what they see as their subjects. Portrayal of Ukraine in Russian media was as a selfish, greedy country that wanted to reap the economic benefits of cheap energy from Russia, while also cozying up to powers Russia considered enemies. Things further declined when Ukrainians supported Georgia in the Russian invasion there, accusing Ukraine of supplying Georgians with weapons. They had spats over whether the Russian Black Sea fleet needed to get Ukraine's permission to enter their territorial waters, which Russia violated anyway. In 2008, Ukraine, with the support of the US, made a bid to join NATO. Putin claimed responsibility for the ethnic Russians living in Ukraine and told American diplomats that Ukraine may fracture and fall apart if they went through with the bid. We further found though through the WikiLeaks cable leak that uh, Putin wanted somebody subservient to Moscow serving in Kiev. And he believed Ukraine to be a fake country. I mean, all countries are fake, but go off, I guess. What we'd see over the next few years was a more concerted effort through covert and then overt means. Russia attempted to stop Ukraine's movement to the West and force them back onto their dominion. In 2009, Ukraine narrowly elected a man by the name of Viktor Yanukovych. He was probably the most pro-Russian president in Ukraine's history. He made controversial agreements with Russia, like a lease extension on Russia using naval bases in exchange for discounted gas. Yanukovych still tried to have it both ways though, seeing an association with a customs union between a bunch of former Soviet states while also seeking EU membership. Russia warned threatened them with instability and state collapse if they were to enter into the free trade agreement with the EU. Specifically, they warned of separatist movements springing up in the Russian-speaking eastern parts of the country I mentioned earlier. Russia also started customs bans on Ukrainian imports. In November of 2013, Yanukovych stopped discussions of joining the European Union, which was met with a massive wave of protests across the country known as the Euromaidan. The protests turned violent as police brutalized the protesters. Ukraine's future seemed in serious question. This decision to embrace the EU or Russia seemed to divide the country, with a small plurality supporting the EU, but a lot of uncertainty overall. 
the protesters demanded Yanukovych's resignation, as well as resuming talks to join the EU. It resulted in Yanukovych needing to resign and eventually flee the country. Snap elections led to a pro-European president and a return to their 2004 constitution. Russia, at that point, was done with the subtle route. Crimea, which was semi-autonomous, broke into political chaos over the revolution. Local pro-Russia militias, as well as Russian special forces and suspicious unmarked troops took over the capital, raising the Russian flag over the city. Parliament held an emergency session, and with what we're pretty sure were unmarked masked Russian soldiers overseeing the meeting, they dissolved government and put the pro-Russian Sergei Astinov into the role of prime minister, a guy who won a commanding 4% of the popular vote in the last election. This very not coerced government called for a referendum on more autonomy for May of 2014. Troops reportedly took their phones, cut off communication, and banned journalists from entering parliament. They also called on Russia to enter into the situation to make sure everything happened legally, which Putin, surprised at such a request of course, graciously stepped in to help. They moved the referendum up to March and changed the question to whether Crimea should not get more autonomy, but seek to declare independence and join Russia. Ukraine's government declared the referendum illegal, but they went forward with it anyway. It turns out though that when as little as a quarter of Crimeans were eligible to vote, but anyone with a Russian passport, regardless of whether they lived there could, and the election was observed by Putin loyal far right political parties, that the result was a highly sus 95.5% in favor of joining Russia. More pro-Russian activity flared up across Ukraine in response, with pro-Russian groups declaring independent republics in the oblasts of Donetsk and Luhansk. With Russia's blessing and a suspicious amount of firepower and soldiers, these republics had been duking it out with Ukraine in this Donbass region for eight years. Relations between Ukraine and Russia were dismal, and skirmishes between the two continued. But it did look like things might improve with the election of Vladimir Zelensky in 2019. He seemed interested in talking to Putin and securing some sort of peace while still forging a path to NATO and the EU. But nonetheless, violence in Donbass began to increase. Intelligence of Russian troops moving near the Ukrainian borderlands began to come out in March of 2021. In July, Putin wrote an essay espousing that all Ukrainians, Belarusians, and Russians should be unified under one all-Russian nation, and denied the existence of a Ukrainian nation. U.S. President Joe Biden and Zelensky tried to threaten sanctions and further violence if Russia did not back off of this violation of Ukrainian sovereignty. Knowing it would start World War III, however, what the U.S. could do was limited compared to the international conquest campaign we've seen America do in the 21st century. Putin was backed into a game of diplomatic chicken, and that obviously didn't end well. On the 24th of February, Russia invaded Ukraine, and since then there has been several months of violent quagmire. Ukraine does seem to be turning the Russians back with the help of mountains and mountains of Western weapons and training. Now, this is a war in progress. So the situation is likely to be quite different by the time you see this. One mounted concern I have, though, is what's going to happen to all of these munitions that we're sending to the country in the years to come? Ukraine, despite a staggeringly intense effort to not mention it, does have a problem of far-right neo-Nazi militias, like the Azov Battalion, fighting with some degree of legitimacy from the Ukrainian state. In my circles of studying the threat of the global far-right, these guys were high on the list right up until the war began. I fear what's going to happen to all of these weapons once the war is over and what all of these resources, training, and equipment will do for a violent right-wing militia and, oh god, we're making Al-Qaeda all over again. And that's why we're here. Just a few months ago, after years of building tension, Russia invaded Ukraine. Thousands of people are dead. And as of this very moment, the war still drags on, month after month, without an end in sight. Russia overplayed its hand, and now Ukraine's condemned to a morass of war, blood, and tears. Now, I need to introduce you to an incredibly Moira Rose sounding word here. Revanchism. There's probably no one word that describes modern Russia and the reasons it's acting the way it has been in Ukraine and on the international stage. The term refers to politics driven by a need for revenge, the idea that a country needs to retaliate against someone or something, especially to regain lost territory. This idea came into the national consciousness 
many times throughout history. After the Franco-Russian War, France lost the Alsace-Lorraine region, and French nationalists started to itch for a war against Germany to reclaim what they felt was rightfully theirs. After they got their wish in the wake of the First World War, German nationalists, angered over their territorial losses and global humiliation in the Great War, turned to the world's most infamous dictator to take out this anger on groups they scapegoated for their loss. And eventually, on the whole world, in the most destructive war in human history. Russian nationalists, who would actually balk at the term nationalist as it has a very different meaning to them, but nonetheless, Russian nationalists seem to feel that their people are entitled to the massive empire the Soviet Union became and saw the collapse of it as a massive humiliation. We can see this in the irrational massive violence in places like Chechnya, Georgia, and now Ukraine. The effects of revanchism is at play here. And like many countries before who harbored this politics of resentment and desire for revenge, they turned to an infamous strongman who promises to bring them back to their former glory and destroy whoever stands in their way. And this is where things get extremely worrying because France isn't Russia of 1870. It's not even Germany of 1919. It's 2022 and Russia is on the same train but sitting on the world's largest stockpile of nuclear warheads. Weapons designed to inflict terrible damage and contaminate regions for decades. Russia is acting irrationally. That's not me talking. Many geopolitics experts have pointed out that Putin normally is a very rational and calculating actor, but this war makes no sense. If cornered and facing defeat or collapse, it wouldn't be outside the bounds of reason to think Putin would consider using Russia's nuclear stockpile to maintain his regime. It might start with the small tactical nukes Russia's been developing to try and make something small enough to use without starting World War III. But you know how these things have a habit of accelerating. This is why the war in Ukraine is such a tense situation. There's not a whole lot we can do to stop them. The stakes for a wrong move here are literally apocalyptic. So you can imagine, while welcoming a new baby into the world, seeing this wave of jingoism in the West and serious calls for us to go to war with a country which could sterilize entire nations fills me with dread. I remember once thinking of an idea for a short story which came from a real situation that I was in. My baby was only a few months old and I took a small break to go to a coffee shop for a bit of podcast and caffeine. But in the shop, this is when I read the news about the serious calls to either initiate or downplay the consequences of literal nuclear war. I kept thinking of the nightmare scenario if the bombs started dropping and I had to barricade inside the shop thinking only of that little baby at home and what his fate would be. And that's kind of where I'm at now to an extent. My videos are produced at a glacial pace and this script took particularly long due to said baby and also because I had a bout of anemia early this year. But despite all those delays, the war is still ongoing and we're still recklessly playing footsie with World War III. So here's the part where I decided to give myself the subheading of what do. Looking at the situation now, it seems that if I had the answer, I'd be a shoe in for the Nobel Peace Prize. Except, you know, I'd actually earn it. The normal response would be to diplomatically isolate Russia and pressure through economic sanctions. The problem is Russia has since the days of the USSR dedicated itself to an economic policy of autarky, Meaning, for this exact reason, they try to be self-sufficient. And because of exports of oil and natural gas, a lot of us stand more to lose from sanctions than they do. There's the less direct intervention, like sending weapons, which it seems we're already doing. It should go without saying that accepting refugees and making safe zones for Ukrainians to escape into is a good idea. The refugee thing seems a little less controversial this time around compared to the Syrian refugee crisis. I just can't figure out quite that is. At the end of the day, there isn't a good answer. And that sucks. Even if there wasn't nuclear Armageddon on the line, we've seen a long history of the West intervening in a conflict like this and it near universally making things worse. A lot worse. If you don't believe me, ask the Twin Towers. I didn't solve the problem, but I hope at the very least, you can understand it with more dimension, which is exactly what I made Step Back to do. It's literally what the name means. Oh, and here's a link to some other videos in the Brick series.